Daniel, Classic Beauties is your second album, and what's you know what's the thought behind that? I mean, was what was did you have a concept in mind putting this together? Yeah, I wanted to focus on uh, some of the like the early music that first really got me going. I wanted to focus on mainstream jazz, actually, the bebop tradition and the main and the swing and things, and get a little deeper in there. Uh, from a compositional point of view and also from a from a drumming point of view because you know i in my career as i'm sure many uh, the freelancing thing you end up working in a lot of different genres and i wanted to have a focus for a while on uh, on the on mainstream jazz experience so that was the uh, thinking behind the writing that that went into the album you know now were there different eras of jazz that you sort of uh, you patterned some of these compositions off or or groups, or sa or a sound. Well, not uh, not particularly. It ended up sounding a little. I mean, one of my colleagues said it sounds like your tunes are a lot like Tad Dameron tunes in some cases, but I didn't plan it that way. I I uh, I, I, I the material that I came up with was fairly 1950s, with a bit of an exception. There's one track that we sort of stretch out on, and, and it's a little more contemporary, modern, in seven four. Uh, that is, I guess, more of a 60s oriented thing but th those are the eras of, of did you focus. reference other music from that period just to uh, find a certain feel to it or well like i like i said like i meant to i meant to just study pre-existing tunes and i ended up getting more into the writing of things so so really just whatever came out was uh well, that's what i came up with from my own my own head writing now drummers are not traditionally the composers in a band you know, or a leader but, you know, guys like you, like Daphnis Prieto and other guys like you, uh, really know how to compose. Now, where did that come from? Did you study this? or I did not study it. And that's why I had to focus on, I want to go back and study it. Because I didn't go to music school, right? I learned from uh, doing uh, and from my family, my father Milton and my brother Mika, all musicians. So I got into it. I didn't go to school, so it's been a, like a continuing education thing for for me, where I like I can fill in the holes where where I feel it's necessary, you know. Um, yeah. There's a nice What's flow it? to all your tunes. I mean, there's a logic to the melodies, the composition, yeah. the transitions, and everything. Where's that come from? That's a good question. You know, uh, I just bought, as you can imagine, like been involved with music for so long, having grown up in a musical house and that. I just think that there's an innate um, talent, I suppose, and creativity, and you have to believe in your in your creativity somewhat, right? You have to say, well, I'm coming up with this little idea, and mm, it seems pretty good, and then if you flesh it out, it can be really something. I um, I didn't really, I don't have a, a full backlog of, of studies, uh, and therefore like a comprehensive catalog of knowledge about different types of tunes and harmony and all that um i'm just exp you know learning what i'm hearing you know exploring what i'm hearing and uh getting to understand how things are uh c constructed uh, in harmony and so forth that was been the interesting part for me because the melodies come to me the feel you know the rhythmic feel comes to me and then so filling in the harmonic aspect is is the exploring for me now, your father was a, a composer for large ensembles. Were you able to play, you know, uh, some of this music for him or, or take your writing to him at some point and say, you know, look, Dad, what do you think? Well, not really. Unfortunately, he passed away j just before I put out my first record. Okay. Yeah. So he never heard my first record, but I was making and preparing for it when he was alive. And, uh, you know, he said, Danny, if you're going to do this, Make something people are going to like. In other words, don't do something really far out there that you get a very small percentage of people will appreciate. And I think he said that because, well, he spent, his, his writing was somewhat populist, even though it was in the classical music realm. And uh, I guess he, he experienced some of the more successful tunes were tunes that a little more accessible. Um, so he, he encouraged me to go that way. But Milton, my dad, and I, we never really had like, uh, okay, son, this is how you do it, type of uh, lessons or sessions, you know. I learned a lot from him just by watching him operate in his, his everyday uh, career, you know, writing for soloists and rehearsing and conducting and stuff like that. So I learned a lot sort of by osmosis just being around it with him. It must have been fairly exciting to have this much music in your life 
at such a grand scale? It was. I mean, it was really, as a kid to go see my dad conduct a full symphony orchestra. You can imagine that's pretty, pretty wonderful, you know. And that's what really got me started playing the drums. Actually, it was it was, it was watching him conduct, and then coming home. And I would take his drums, because he used to be a drummer. I still have his 1952 Ludwigs. I would take his drums and, and separate them as if they were in the percussion section of the symphony. And then I would improvise and go over here and try that and try that. And that was sort of the beginning of my improvising and, and playing drums. So, I, yeah, making up music in my head that way. Now, when you conceived these albums, uh, you wanted to come out and have your own sound, put your own records out. Did you in your mind imagine who the players should be? And could you hear how they would play this in your head? There, uh, I had, I, I put, I picked the personalities for Classic Beauties. There were just some, some fellows who I really wanted to play with. Richard Underhill on alto. You know, alto and trumpet, that's the front line on my record. And maybe that's not so usual. Although, I mean, of course, there are examples of that. But I really wanted Richard on the record because of his spirit and the way he played. Um, Williams Brandy, the trumpet player, was someone I'd been working with, and I just, you know, thought he's such a spot-on player and dug where he was coming from, and I thought he had the right approach, the appreciation of the history and things, um, for for the music that I was making. So Williams on there, he studied down in New Orleans and with Ellis Marsalis and things like that. So plus, these guys are are really fine soloists too. It's yeah. more than just the composition. These guys can really bring something to it. You know. Uh, Robbie, the uh, Robbie Botosh, the keyboard player. I guess a lot of people know him now because he's, you know, awfully good and words getting out there. But I wanted him. He's on my first record. Robbie is, and and I, I wanted him back for Classic Beauties. And he's just, he was just so wonderful, as usual, just perfect, right in the pocket for for all the stuff I was doing. He swings so hard and everything, you know. And uh, and then Kieran Overs on bass, who was, you know, knew what to do exactly and everything. And I had some good experiences playing with him. So, <laughs> you know, I wanted those people on board. Now, uh, as you picked Karen for bass, did you consider who would lock in with you easily or keep that group? Now, was he on the first album? Who played bass on the first album? No, I had Mark Rogers play. That was a nice, there was a nice sound to that between the bass and the drums. I Thanks. mean, it was a flow that was like, you know, it just, there was a great pulse to that. Yeah, yeah. Did you feel you found that in the second one? It was a little different. I mean, every player is different, you know, and, and, and Kieran has a really different sound than, than Mark does. Uh, but I like the way it worked out. I thought it came together, you know. Now, if you were going to do... It's, we both know how difficult it is to do records and the financing behind it and how difficult it is to market and sell them. But it still doesn't, uh, you know, take away from the fact that you're always thinking ahead. <laughs> what would you do if you did another one? I would like to take my working band, which is a quartet, and do a bunch more gigs, which I'm setting up. And I would like to take that sort of well-worked-in band and take that into either a live recording or a studio setting and get that sort of cohesiveness down on, uh, on disc with some new, uh, mostly new material, maybe some, some revisiting some of the older material. But I'd like to get that live band thing happening because, uh, you know, the last two albums, they were kind of, the bands were studio creations, you know, and uh, so I'd like to get that live band happening. Daniel, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.